Well, I've never been in a church where the music was a better blessing to my heart than this church right here. In fact, the preacher said that he could bring in a busload of singers from somewhere in Atlanta. I think the bus has already arrived at Canyon Baptist Church if, uh, because you have such good quality singing here. What a blessing. Brother Brock, thank you so very much. And it's so good to meet him and to hear about the work in Germany and we'll know how to pray for him. And of course, his, present, his video presentation, Christ. Isn't that awful? I know exactly how he feels. I've had many, many sermons that's Christ. <laughs> I just hope we don't have one tonight, you know. <laughs> but uh, this is a crash here tonight, so it might be. But I sure am glad to be here. Amen. And the preacher says that the Bartons are a friend to the church, and indeed we are, because you're special people. It was a special meaning in our life to come here. And I thought Brother, Brother Ingram was never going to ask me back, to be honest with you. No, 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 I'm just teasing. Uh, we always like to come here, and we praise the Lord for it. And when he called me, boy, he had an outline of things for me to do, to preach about stewardship, to preach about missions, to preach about revival. And uh, I said, I'll do it. And uh, then when we quit talking on the telephone, I says, Lord, what have I got myself into? Because you know good and well that I don't have sermons to fit all that stuff together. And so, Lord, I'll just do the best I can. When you have five sermons, you have to put a lot of names to them. <laughs> and so you just keep preaching. I sure am glad to be here and looking forward to see what God's going to do. Sunday is Tithers Demonstration Day. That means everybody in the church is given a tithe of their income on one particular day to show everybody what could be done if everybody in the church was tithing. Now, you, those of you that are tithing already, you'll continue to do that. But those of you that are not tithing, you're going to start it, and you're going to see as you start it that you can't outgive God, and God's going to challenge you to see what your participation and contribution with the entire body here at Central, at not, this is Canaan Baptist Church, is going to do when you work together. So I hope that you'll remember that. Now that's not your faith promise missions that you're going to be giving. That's your tithes to the church this coming Sunday. And I'm praying that God would give you a great day and looking forward to hearing the report of what you do this coming Sunday. I want you to open your Bibles tonight to the book of Psalms 119 again. This is where we started Sunday morning. That's where we're going to end tonight. Thank you so much, Brother Ingram for uh, having us here. Our prayers are for you and the church, and we can ever do anything that you need for us for. We're willing to come and help you. If it's dig ditches or sweep the parking lot or whatever it is, we'd be glad to help you here. Now this week we start, let me read my text first. In Psalms 119 and verse 105, if you have that. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. So quicken me, or revive me, O Lord, according to thy word. Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet... Do I not forget thy law? The wicked have laid a snare, a trout for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sweet spirit that permeates the place here at Canaan Baptist. We know, dear Heavenly Father, that this is not just work of men, but it's the work of God when there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that in this pulpit the word is preached on this platform, and gospel music is rendered, and in the pews, Heavenly Father, people are practicing the word of God as they come in and as they go out. And they're living the truth of God. And Lord, we have done our best to be a vessel this week for you to use. And if any good thing has happened, it's been because, Lord, you have done it, not me. But Lord, would you allow me to be a vessel tonight? 
to surrender myself to thee for you to use, to be a help and encouragement to this pastor, uh, to be a benefit of this church ministry, most of all to be glorifying to the name of the Lord Jesus and to our Heavenly Father which is in heaven. We'll give all the praise because we've asked in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. If you remember, we started with a definition of stewardship on Sunday morning and I just came up with that definition and it might not be very good to you, but it's what God's given me. That stewardship is the management. That's what you've been doing in your life. Stewardship is the management and the accountability someday to God for all that you are and for all that you do and for all that you possess uh, for all of your life to the glory of God. Now on Sunday morning we started in the Sunday school but said it is more blessed to give than receive. We said that it is the management and the accountability for who we are. We know who we are now because there's been messages that said that we are not our own. We have been bought by price. We belong by the price of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and we belong to him. And so all that we are and all that we do, and we learned last night about the work that God's given us, the work of honoring God in everything that we do, we are going to someday give an account to Him for our work. And then all that we possess, the tithe is the Lord's, and it is more blessed to give than receive, and that's stewardship. And then we're going to take up tonight that last part of that definition, and that is As long as we live upon this earth, we are to be good stewards of uh, 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 of our lives and of our ministry to God Almighty. And then the last part of that definition is to the glory of God. Now I want us to look into the book of Psalms 119, and as I said Sunday morning and bringing the message from Psalms 119, it's divided into 22 stanzas. 22 stanzas of eight verses each, 176 verses. And this great psalm is a psalm that is dedicated to exalt the word of God. Did you know that the scripture says in the book of Psalms that God has exalted his word above his name? Now that is some more exaltation. That God says my word is important. And as we follow that, God is going to bless us. But I want you to notice in the text what he says. Down in verse 11, he says, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. They are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes. And he uses the word always, even until the end. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're thinking about being a steward, not just for a season, But we've committed our life to the Lord for us to be a steward until the very end of our life. We make a commitment. Last night we talked about those individuals in the book of Nehemiah that that made a covenant with God. That signed their name to the covenant and said we're going to follow the oaths of your holy word. We learn many, many testimonies in the word of God of people that said I will serve you to my death. We go back to the book of Psalms chapter 37 and there was old David. He was like the rest of us. He had some little blimps on his schedule, in his life. He had some little things that, uh, that certainly we talk about sometimes, but yet God says of David, he's a man after my own heart. And he says in Psalms 37 verse 25, I have been young and when he was young, he observed. And he says, now I am old, and he's still observing. And he says, this is what I have observed in life, that to be young and now I'm old. Yet in all of my observation, I've never known of God not taking care of his own. Uh, Isn't it wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, that God has made a promise to us to watch over us. And who honors God? God is going to honor now, many of you in this building and out have been Christians maybe longer than I have. I was saved 63 years ago next month, February the 18th, 1956, as a 12-year-old boy, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've not been the best Christian in all the world and still am not. But I want you to know one thing. I have been a child of God ever since because, not because of what I've done, 
but because of what I accepted that Jesus Christ has done. He died for my sins upon the cross of Calvary. For 63 years I have been a Christian, 57 of them I've been trying my best to preach the Word of God. And some of you are even longer, 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or 60 years or even more. And in the course of our life, we have had great trials and tests. Sometimes the thought has come to many of our minds that maybe we ought to just give up the journey. In fact, we have observed in our Christian life, in our journey, in our walk with God, people come in into the church and they are hot coals, it seems, for a while. But then those coals die down and now they're no longer in church. Along the way, something happened to those individuals and we don't always understand and we don't always know and we're not their judge, but there is a judge that's going to judge them. Something might have happened. They might have got bruised at church or they might have got battered or something might have happened that they got bitter. Something might have happened in their life. Somebody might have said something and in their carnal state of mind, not knowing that nothing should offend them, they got offended. And they quit coming to church. And they are known as what we, we refer to sometimes as war casualties. They are casualties of war. They are no longer serving God. They never listen to a song like you have here at Canaan. They never listen to a sermon that is preached like Brother Ingram preaches. They never come to an assembly and have fellowship with God's own people simply because they're casualties and they're out of step with God and they're out of step with God's people and they're not good stewards, ladies and gentlemen, if they're saved at all. But the question is, is this, how do we keep ourselves from becoming one of them? Now, I want to tell you, I did not make that statement for us to be judgmental. Because we are going to have to face God ourselves. Nobody else is going to face him for us. And we're not going to face God for anybody else, for ourselves. And we don't want to get an attitude is because we have stuck it out that we are better than somebody else. Don't get that Holy Joe attitude. Because I want you to know, without God, oh, all of us in this building would be nothing. I am divine. And the Bible says, except you abide in me, you can do nothing, and you are nothing. John says that I must decrease, that he might increase. And oh, as we think about that, we know those individuals. The psalmist is dealing with that issue in this particular stanza of Psalms 119. How do I stop? Brother Ingram, I've known a lot of preachers that started preaching and they were, uh, they were hot preachers and they were successful preachers and then something happened. Just a few days ago down in Panama City, Florida, there was a man that FEMA sent to pick up the trash around our building, 110 pine trees, if you don't mind, over 40 double trailer truck loads of debris they, held, they hauled off. Well, to come find out that the man that was doing that was a pastor for 12 years. His dad had trained him. His dad before him was an independent Baptist preacher and he'd pastored. And something happened that got him out of the ministry and driving a truck. There's nothing wrong with driving a truck. In fact, it was a blessing to us. But I thought about why are you not in the ministry any longer? The question is, what can we do to make sure that it doesn't happen to us? Brother Brock, I admire you. I know nothing about you except what this week, but I admire you. Anybody that go to the mission field and stay 40 years in one place and serve God and preach the gospel and establish four churches, they've got some spizzerankum to them. Amen. Y'all know what spizzerankum is, I guess. You know, we're not far from Alabama, and everybody in Alabama uses that word. I mean, it, it means some stick them. It means some get up and go. And I admire anybody that's gone out to serve God and stayed by the stuff. What's going to keep us from becoming a casualty of war? The psalmist deals with that. Let's look and see what he says. Did you know this? Hey, listen, for every one of us, the word of God says this in the book of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. He says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. 
I think I mentioned last night that I have written out a lot of resignations. I wanted to quit. I've even thought of a thousand reasons why I could quit and why I should quit. And there's a lot of folks said, you ought to have quit. But I didn't. Because there's, Jeremiah said, there's fire in my bones. Because of the word of God, what God's done for me. Somebody has always reminded me that there was somebody that loved the unlovable. And he died for me upon the cross of Calvary. The Bible says, be thou faithful unto death. You do that, he says. And I will give you a crown of life. Simply because you have been faithful and you've stayed by this stuff and you followed the word of God and you've kept the commandments of God and you've done your best. And listen, we are, it is not a matter of doing our best. It is a matter of stewards that God's working within us and you stayed because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice several things here. And uh, I, I didn't know that I was preaching as long, but Brother John brought a picnic lunch with him to church tonight, just in case I preach long tonight. I don't know. But I'm going to try to make it brief. Number one, I want you to look in the opening verse of this stanza. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What does that teach us? It teaches us this, to give perception to your path. Give perceptions to your path. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need a light when we walk in darkness. And when you begin to perceive the path of life, that word path is not, is not just the path that we're walking down. He's talking about more than a little trail, more than a little path, more than a road. He's talking about the whole of life, my path. As the psalmist says in the opening chapter of this particular uh, psalm, Psalms 119, blessed are the undefiled in the way. In verse 5 it says, oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes, that my way, my path, my decision, my direction. He was perceiving, perceiving his path. The first familiar verse addressed to the issue of direction. We all need direction. Young couples need direction how to raise a family. People need direction on how to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches need direction on what to do to fulfill the ministry that God has given. Missionaries go to the field and they need direction. The scripture tells us how to find direction. That is by using the word as a lamp under our feet and a light under our path and he gives us direction. What does the scripture say about that? It says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall give you direction. He shall direct thy paths. Oh, here he is talking about this. He says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Now, my wife is the ambassador of the flashlight at our house. We have flashlights everywhere in case the lights go off. And there were several weeks that we had no power and we lived in the dark. Hey, when you're used to all of these lights and all of a sudden there's no lights, there's no water, there's nothing. And at night you sat there and she sat over there and she had a flashlight and I sat over here in the dark and all we could do is just sit and look at each other. She had the flashlight. Every time you move, she would turn on the flashlight. Sometimes she would shine it in your eyes. I said, don't shine it in my eyes. Shine it where I'm going. I don't know where you're going, she said. <laughs> but God always knows where you're going. Did you know why God put your little toe on your foot? <laughs> to find furniture in the dark, that's why. <laughs> but praise God, when we are seeking for direction in life, we have the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, and that's what he gives us. It is a lamp under our feet and a light under our path. Ladies and gentlemen, that's direction. Sometimes we need to work on the lamp. It's just like a lamp. Did you know if you have a light, you have to have it on the path that you're going and because we walk in darkness. And God says, you make sure that you stay in the Word of God. The Word of God will give you direction like the North Star to sailors on the calm sea. It gives a solace and satisfaction and comfort and warmth like glowing embers of an, on an 
autumn campfire. It gives security like a faithful centurion guarding his post. It gives a signal or a message like a lighthouse marking the way for ships blinded by the veil of fog. And it will keep you on the right course of life. It will keep you from turning right, keep you from turning left. It will take you down the path that God has given us to give. And so in chapter 119, verse 105, there is the perception of your path. That's what we are accountable for is our life. Secondly, I want you to look at three verses now. Verses 106 says this. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgment. He's come to the place and he says, I wanted to go on record. I have sworn that I will perform it. I will keep thy righteous judgment. May I ask you a question? Have you done as the psalmist has written in this book? Have you sworn in your whole life that you're going to uh, keep thy, pre- thy righteous judgments? I will keep thy righteous judgments. I want to perform it. And so the other was a perception that gave direction and now we see something else. It is persistence that brings determination. Determination to serve God. Hey, listen, we're not just going to serve God because I'm determined, determined, competitiveness. We serve God because we see what he has done for us and we mean business with our profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and yet we want to perform God's statutes that he's taught us. Look at verse 109. My soul is continual in my hand. Yet do I not forget thy law. Yet do I not forget thy law. May I ask you, how how much Bible reading do you do? Very easy. My son was sick on the last Sunday of the month, and I know he was gone to see his kids, and I preached on Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I had the privilege of saying, how many of you read your Bible through the year 2018? And man, there was a whole host of folks in our church that raised their hand, they read the Bible through. Can I ask you, are you reading the Bible through this year? Uh, It's the greatest book that has ever been written. It is God's love letter to you, and I guarantee you, If you get a nice love letter, you want to keep reading it and reading it and reading it. And God's word is a love letter to each and every one of us. Yet do I not forget thy law. He goes on to say in verse 112, I incline my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. I'm going to live for you all the days of my life. That's young people, middle-aged people people that are looking at the stage of life that they say we're getting old and those get to the fact that they'll own up to the truth. I am old, yet they says I'm going to perform it to the very end. As we think about this section of determination, it tells us here all of these things, how wonderful it is that we are determined not just based on our, our own strength to do it, but God living through us. He set the example, and we are more than conquerors through him. I read this illustration, and my, it's an amazing illustration. I've never heard anything like it. On February the 15th, 1921, there was a doctor performing an appendectomy. Uh, I don't know if you've had an appendectomy or not. It's hard for me to say. I had mine. I'm a member of the Royal Order of Scarred Stomach. And he was performing an appendectomy in the operating room of the Kane Summit Hospital. The diagnosis was clear. He had an inflamed appendix. And Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane, K-I-N-E, performed the surgery. The novelty of this operation was the use of local anesthesia instead of in a major surgery. Not, Not just general anesthesia, but local. And this is the amazing thing that he was showing that it was about local anesthesia and he says it is far safer and far better. The second novelty of this operation was that Dr. Kane was the patient. He operated on himself. Now, I don't think I could do that. That would be more difficult than eating a grub worm sandwich, I tell you that. <laughs> 
He operated on himself. Why? To show folks that of the use of local anesthesia. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that Jesus Christ came to this earth, was all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the question is, why did he do all of this? To show us that because of we are in him, we can do those things that he lives through us. How wonderful it is. Oh, how we ought to be directed by the word of God, but we ought to be determined in the word of God to serve him all the days of our life. We looked at verse 7 and it says, I'm afflicted, very much quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. I'm afflicted. There's nobody that serves the Lord Jesus Christ for any time that doesn't go through some kind of affliction. As we think about all of these afflictions, here's I'm afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord. Revive me, O Lord, according to thy word. And we've heard about direction and determination. And this verse tells us about preservation. Preservation, because if you want to remain faithful to the, to, 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 to the Lord and to seek God's power and His preservation when you're suffering or afflicted, oh, you see, the Word of God is there to help you. Psalms 27, verse 9, Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Hey, isn't it wonderful that God is always there to give strength when we need it? He's our Lord. He is our strength. He is our shield. Psalms chapter 40 and verse 17, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tear, no blood. Hey, isn't it wonderful tonight to know that God thinks about us? Amen. He knows every one of us. He even knows my name. My mom used to walk out on the back porch and when she was calling me to do an errand or to come to eat and she would pronounce my name. She didn't call me Max. She called me Mackie. Mackie. And I would hear that voice and I would be doing something and if it was time for supper and I was hungry, I would drop what I was doing and I'd run home. If I was doing something I didn't want to leave too quick, I delayed a little. And when she said, Mackie, the second time, I remembered my mom means business. I'll try her one more time, I'll wait. And then when she comes out with your full name, not just part of your name, but every word of your name, she said, you better get here. Did you know she knows my name? But listen, God knows our name. Isn't that wonderful? Max, Max, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee as we think about preservation. Psalms 94, verse 17, unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Oh, what the Lord has done for us. George Mueller built many orphanages at Asterdown, England. He relied only upon God to supply the money and food needed to support the hundreds of homeless children. And a man of radiant faith, he kept a motto on his desk for many years right there to remind him. And that motto and that little plaque that he had on his desk said this, it matters to him about you. You ever had some hurts? Did you know isn't it wonderful that somebody at the church will put their arm around your shoulder and say that I'm praying for you? I see folks right here that's had hurts as long as I have known them. Glenda and I pray for some that's had terrible accidents and lost loved ones, and gone through suffering of cancer and this and that and the other. We pray for you when we hear about it. There's some here tonight. But I want to tell you, there's something more important than just your friends mattering about you. That's when God says, you matter to me. Isn't that wonderful? That every one of us matter to God Almighty. I don't want to keep us going until the end of our life. There as we think about that. Oh, as all of his problems, as we think about what God's done for us, we matter to him. Verse 108 says this. It says, Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. 
here we're going to see veneration because we're going to see there's a regard with a reverential respect for God's help, for what God does. The verse tells us, if you desire to serve the Lord to the end, then foster an attitude of praise and gratefulness in your heart. Everywhere you go and everything the Bible says, praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord. In everything give thanks for this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. Brother Ingram, when I was a young preacher, man, I wanted to be a bold preacher. I wanted to speak with authority. And I had it as my life verse. Pray for me that I may open my mouth boldly, make known the mysteries of the gospel. I use that word bold, boldly, boldly. And I used that and man, somebody answered that prayer so much it got me in so much trouble. <laughs> boldly, boldly, boldly. And I changed my life verse. I said, Lord, I need a life verse. Everybody wants you to sign their Bible and everybody has a life verse. I didn't know people did that. I had to come up with um, Dr. Lee Robertson, Romans 8, 28, and this, that, and the other. And I said, God, I need a life verse. And I really believe the Lord directed me to Psalms 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And every day of my life, I go over that verse. At People's Baptist Church, every Sunday morning we would start our service, I would say, this is the day the Lord hath made, and we will, and they would say, continue it, rejoice, and be glad in it. And this is what I learned about that verse. You may not have the same idea about the sovereignty of God, but I believe that God is in control of things, especially direct in our life. His word directs us. We honor him, he honors us. He directs our past. And I believe that everything that comes our way that God's teaching us or blessing us or showing us, He's doing something in our life in every situation that comes up. He's working on us. Sometimes I would go to the office and my secretary would say, we got all these problems, this, that, the other. And I said, this is the day the Lord hath made, but some folks are sure trying to mess it up. <laughs> You've had those days. But this is the day the Lord hath made. And we rejoice in that. Did you know I have never known anyone that, were, uh, that was practicing the, the work of rejoicing that got bitter in their heart when they was praising God for his goodness. Amen. Amen. Norman Pollard was the chairman of deacons at People's Baptist Church when I went there. The greatest, one of the greatest soul winning men I have ever known in my life was Norman Pollard. He worked at the DuPont polyester plant and uh, between Get Greenville and Kinston, North Carolina for years and what a testimony he had. He won so many people at work and so many preachers as Norman Pollard led me to the Lord. His wife died with cancer and left him all alone. He came to church and it was not a year or two years after his wife died with cancer that he came down with cancer. One of the best you would have to know him to know, even to appreciate what I'm attempting to say. I mean, he loved the Lord. He loved the Bible. He was a soul winner. He went through all that chemotherapy, and oftentimes he would say, Brother Barton, I'm hurting so bad I can't sit on the pew. I said, we'll put a nice chair out in the lobby for you, Brother, Brother Pollard, and you can get up and go as you please, whatever you want to. And he did that. And oftentimes a man going through chemotherapy, his body is in great pain. He'd been sick and all the week and he would come to church and we would see him walking down the aisle and there's somebody with him. And we come down at time, invitation time and he says, Brother Barton, I led this man to the Lord this week and he's come forward today to trust Jesus Christ and make it public that he's trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and follow Christ in believer's baptism. Amen. Affliction, but yet rejoicing. Listen, as long as you can keep your rejoicing intact, you praise God for everything that God comes His way and here is veneration. Psalms 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times, He says. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalms 40, verse 3, and He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. God is good, is He not? I got a text about 6 o'clock on my way over here to the church from Dave McCoy over at People's Baptist Church at McDonald. 
He said, Brother Barton, I pray for you every week. But especially, I prayed for you this week. And I thought when I heard that, man, that makes me rejoice to know that someone, somewhere, thinks enough of me to make, to, to make a prayer to God for my benefit. Oh, how we ought to praise the Lord for God's wonderful blessings. We look at verse 108, verse B, the, the B part, and here we find something else that we need to do. And teach me thy judgments. We are ever learning about what God has done. And this is the education process. Teach me thy judgments. Teach me the word of God. Have you ever studied the Bible and you read and read and read and you kind of came up a blank and you don't know what this means or whatever? The psalmist says, teach me. Hey, isn't it wonderful that you have a church where the word of God is preached that when you come and sit, you listen to the truth of Almighty God. Teach me. You accept it of what God has given you through your preacher and your Sunday school teacher. And you come into church and you learn. In fact, the Bible says this. Study to show thyself the proven to God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are to study the word of God. The scripture says in the book of Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. More, oh, what a verse, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Oh, we use that verse and sometimes we stop there. But the next verse says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Verse 12 says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. God has an education process for us. And the Holy Spirit, as we study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit goes right along with that Holy Spirit inspired book and it says that's the word of God. When the preacher preaches and you hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you says he is telling the truth. And sometimes the Holy Spirit says he's telling the truth and you pull your feet up under the pew because your toes are being walked upon. Anybody know what I'm saying? Say amen. amen. It's God's education process. You're serving God all the days of your life. Look at verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Here's the help that God gives us in times of opposition. He says, oh, the wicked have laid a snare for me, and in their endeavor to trap me, I did not err from thy precepts. Oh, it's terrible to have opposition, have somebody against you. I told Brother Ingram today at lunchtime, there was a lady in our church. Man, I thought she loved me. And she told everybody, oh, how I love Brother Barton. One Sunday morning, I overheard her at the top of her voice. Everybody, there was dozens of people in the big lobby of our church. I heard her say, oh, Brother Barton, I'm so glad that you're our pastor. You're such a blessing. Everybody could hear that testimony. And man, I felt so good. A woman giving me a testimony like that. I, Brother Barton, I love you so much. Your messages are such a help. Three weeks later, she left the church. And she was out telling everybody what a sorry pastor I was. And I had not even seen her, I don't think, in the three-week period. I wonder what in the world I did. You know, there's, there's things that sometimes that you feel is opposition. There's things that, you know, listen, Glenn and I, I took a stand in the church one time and there was somebody that didn't like us and they put a full page ad in the newspaper. You can look it up in the newspaper, the Daily Reflector of Greenville, North Carolina, a full page ad in the paper critical of Max Barton and People's Baptist Church. That hurts. But yet, listen what the psalmist says. I did not forget thy precepts. I depended upon thee. We all have distractions that come our way. And yet God allows us, as we keep his precepts, 
to keep our eyes upon the goal, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, praise the Lord for those individuals that say, Oh, Lord, teach me thy process. Teach me thy precepts. And then verse 11 says this, Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever. I want that to be my whole testimony, the heritage of my life, thy testimonies, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Could I ask you a question tonight? Do you really rejoice in the Word of God as we think about what God has given us? And this is the process of jubilation. I will rejoice in thy precepts. Oh, God is good. Sunday morning, I said, the cheerfulness of God's word. Here we talk about the preciousness and the pleasure of God's word. He's talking about jubilation. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God yonder, thinking, us individuals verse 3 of that chapter says for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds serving God for the rest of our life to the very end Christ Jesus is our noble example but he has given us others and there was one man that that gives us a great example, the Apostle Paul. And he said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that loves his appearing. Amen. Amen. We are stewards for the rest of our life until someday he comes. Amen. Stewards of all that we are, all that we do, all that we possess. For all of our life, we are stewards of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I preach what you put upon my heart. God, give us a desire, give us a longing tonight to walk with you and to be faithful as you commanded us dear Lord to love mercy and to do justly and to walk humbly with our God Lord never let a day go by that we don't walk with you you've given us your word dear Lord to light our path to direct us you've given your word to cheer us and encourage us you've given us your word to protect us you've given us the statutes of your word dear Lord that gives us surety in times of instability, that gives us hope sometimes, dear Lord, when nowhere we can see hope except trusting on an unchanging God. And Lord, tonight in this service, may each and every one of us say, I will keep his precepts forever. I will not forget thy law. In a moment, we're going to stand for the invitation. If you're here tonight and you resolve in your heart, Lord, I want to be faithful to you all the days of my life. We have an altar that you could come. Just say, Lord, help me to perform it to your glory, to your honor, to your glory. If there's someone here tonight that is not saved, God's thinking about you. He wants to save you. In a moment, would you come? As we all stand, Lord, would you please deal with our hearts tonight? Draw people into the Lord Jesus. In his name we ask it. Amen. As we begin to sing, God has spoken to your heart. Would you come?